Thank you very much. Um, I can't exactly thank the organizers. I should thank my co-organizers for putting up with this somewhat something of a breach of protocol because I am both officially a co-organizer and a speaker. I certainly will thank Bears for welcoming us all here. Uh, this is a surface with of degree four, which has uh, quite a few lines, as you may see. Oh, right. Um, that's not an example of surfaces I'm going to talk about today. Unfortunately, I'm still one or two steps away from making a similar picture. Uh, so I do have. Uh, oh, here we go. I do have several uh, new bounds on the counts of lines on the sur surface of given degree and some similar questions. So I'll start by introducing these problems and then uh, outline, you know, first of all, what the new result is, how, how more or less I prove it, and some of the strange mathematics that I run into when I ask when my bounds are attained, which does actually happen. And close with some, oops, what am I here, with some further indications of uh, you know, other, other possible directions in this, uh, in this uh, general area and some, how I got into this in the first place. So just the question of how many lines a surface in P3 can have of given degree, uh, I, think I can legitimately call a venerable question. Uh, we assume, of course, the degree is at least three because surfaces of degree one and two have, can have infinitely many lines. It should also be smooth. I mean, for example, if you have a cone over, uh, over a curve that has infinitely many lines over this algebraically closed field. And I'm going to use the notation n of d for this maximum. And that can depend on the characteristic. So n, n0 is for curves and for surfaces and characteristic 0, which might as well be over the complex numbers. And for each p, I'll n, n sub p be a maximum I can get in characteristic p. There are also interesting questions about nq and n of a given finite field, and there are some, there are some previous results about that, but I don't have anything new to report here. And I mentioned already, we assume that d equals 3 at least. And for d equals 3, it's a classical question. Uh, 27 lines on any cubic, any smooth cubic over an algebraically closed field. They form a very beautiful combinatorial configuration with lots and lots of symmetries. Um, once you get past d equals 4, typical surfaces have no lines, but you can certainly find some surfaces that have you know, one, one or more lines, and there are, you know, some mathematics departments have these classical 19th century models that show, like, a Kummer cortex, and basically that's singular, but with 16 lines and so forth. So you can ask, well, how many lines could you possibly have? Uh, and ask similar questions for other, que for other contexts, like, surfaces that are complete intersections in higher PNs. Uh, particular interesting case, which I think we ran already across in uh, Tony's uh, presentation here earlier this week, uh, what's sometimes called a double plane. So this is a complete intersection, but in a weighted projective space. So you start from some even degree polynomial, and you assume that the curve it cuts out is smooth, because that makes a double cover branched along it an irreducible surface in that uh, in that uh, projected, weighted projective space, what corresponds to lines are lines in the two-dimensional space that are tangent to it, to that curve everywhere. So whenever it meets the curve, it meets it to multiplicity 2, and that's equivalent to saying that the polynomial p, 2, 4, 6, etc., that the polynomial p, uh, it reduces to, restricts to a perfect square here, and therefore that if you take its pre-image in the double plane, it becomes two lines joined at all of these points instead of a single hyperelliptic curve. Um, and then you can ask, well, again, how many such things can there be in characteristic zero and any positive characteristic, well, except two, where you have to ask a different kind of question. Uh, <coughs> And again, there are some classical examples of this. It's infinite for d equals 2 because I just need one tangent for 
a curve of genus, well, of degree two, and you at any point can have a tangent. Degree four, it's bitangent through quartic, beautiful standard configuration, 28 bitangents, 56 preimages. Past that, there is only finitely, you know, usually there aren't any, and you can ask what's the largest number, let's say, of tritangents to a uh, sexted, to a smooth sexted curve. So, as often happens, if we have a question like this, how many x can there be, and we don't know the answer, well, we can find lower bounds, which means usually constructing something, and we can find upper bounds, which means proving some inequalities. So the lower bounds, which require construction, are in principle easier, though it can take some, uh, you know, it can take some insight to find them. And a lot of them revolve around the so-called Fermat or diagonal surface, which is the sum of, which you get by setting the sum of these powers equal zero. It's smooth if you're, if you're, if D is not multiple of the characteristic, and it has at least three D squared lines because you can split the four coordinates into pairs in three ways, and for each one of them, you can make the sum of these d's powers and the sum of these d's powers be zero independently. And each one of those can be done in d ways, so three times d times d. And that's actually the best we know in characteristic zero with only far too many exceptions. I don't think there is a fi infinite exam family of d's for which we have a surface of a smooth surface of degree D over the complex numbers with more than this many lines. The, the few examples for which we do include the famous sequence 4, 6, 8, 12, and 20, which are connected with uh, so-called platonic or regular uh, polyhedra. And if you embed your polyhedra in the Riemann sphere, it's the roots of some uh, homogeneous polynomial of degree 2, and you can construct this uh, smooth uh, degree D per no, uh, degree surface, which has you know p of x one x naught equals p of x three x two, that's smooth and it has d squared lines as I indicated before plus n d lines whenever you have an automorphism of that configuration of roots, you have n uh, lines that you get by joining the the two uh, line the x zero x one and the x two x three lines. And, of course, these polyhedra have lots of symmetries, and so n is large. In fact, the, Riemann, the Fermat surface you can construct the same way, except there you got, just get a polygon, and that has two n symmetries, excuse me, two d symmetries, and that gives you, again, 3d squared, whereas here the numbers are larger, and the counts are 64 in characteristic, excuse me, for 64 for a quartic, and then 180 for a sextic, and so forth, until you get to a degree 20 surface with 1,600 lines. That may be the last case for which we know more than 3D squared. Uh, you can do much better in positive characteristic. Uh, one way to see it is that uh, in positive characteristic, if you are working with D equals Q plus 1 and your ground field contains a field of Q squared elements, then suddenly this has a lot more symmetry than just the regular degon, because uh, a regular degon is, if you think about it, as being embedded in a circle, and a circle is equivalent to a projective line, and if you have all the points of a projective line, that has a huge group of symmetries, PGL2, and in fact, you over FQ squared, you can make this equivalent to this form, which is invariant up to scaling under all projective linear transformations. And so that gives you a much larger number of symmetries. And if you plug it into our formula before, you get more than q to the fourth line, which is way more than the three q squared lines that we would get in characteristic zero. And as was true with the Fermat surface, this only shows a subgroup of those morphisms. There is actually PGU4, because this is basically a Hermitian form. That's why these are always called, often called Hermitian surfaces or a Hermitian trick. If you think about it, it's the inner product of x with x to the q, and if you're over the sphere of x q squared, this is a Galois involution, and so it's basically a unitary form, and it has a huge number of automorphisms. And the lines in it correspond to maxima isotropic subspaces, and there's only one orbit of those, but again, the group is huge, so we have a huge number of lines. And there's similar construction for uh, <coughs> the... the double plane situation, where this time we assume that, again, degree is one more than 
a prime power, the prime has to be odd because we need degree even. And then you have a Hermitian curve, which still has PGU3 symmetry, and that has QQ plus one point. Each one of them has a tangent which meets it in multiplicity Q plus one. And so in particular, all of the multiplicities are even, and so you get as many as many, you know, x d over two times tangent lines at their points, and that gives you that many uh, line pairs on the double on the uh, excuse me on the uh, double plane. So, for example, in characteristic five, if you look at the surface that Tony was showing us in his presentation, uh, this has 126 tritangents, which are actually tangents with, with uh, six fold contact in characteristic five, uh, <coughs> which is bigger than you can have in characteristic zero. So what about upper bounds? Well, for most D, the best upper bound we know uh, was already proved 150 years <coughs> ago by Klebsch. It grows as D squared, and the multiple is a bit large, it's 11 D squared. Uh, it's sharp for D equals three, has to be at least three in all of this game. Okay. It's sharp for D equals three, and uh, Segre, about 80 years ago, 70, whatever, three generations ago, claimed a slight improvement, C11 D squared, but minus four D, etc. But apparently there is a subtle error, Rams and Schutt uh, looked, at, looked at this again in 2012, and actually found counterexamples to a lemma. So uh, that bound we no longer have, and it's back to 11 D squared. Uh, that's in characteristic zero. And likewise, uh, <coughs> Klebsch gives us, four, so the first case after D equals three, which is classical, is quartic, so quartic K3 surfaces. Klebsch gives us 80. The Seger bound would have been 76. Uh, the, the best we know was already obtained by Schur, that's a tetrahedral construction, uh, 1882. And Seger also claimed at the same time that he proved that this 64 was maximal, but he was using the same lemma, and that lemma is not correct, so the proof is not correct. But we now know that it is correct because uh, <coughs> Schutt and Rams, who's not here, I'm afraid, right? Oh, there you are, great, sorry. Uh, so both of these co-authors were able to prove that, in fact, it is 64. And a few years later, the Tower of Ettenberg and Sertus, how do you pronounce that? Uh, show that actually it's the unique example that attains 64 over C. And as far as I know, no other value of N naught of D is known. We have upper and lower bounds and never the twain of met. Uh, <coughs> I think even less was known in positive characteristic. Uh, in fact, I don't know that for general D there has been any explicit upper bound, or there certainly has to be some upper bound by you know, fine dimension reasons. Uh, the case of Q equals three, uh, excuse me, of D equals four, so that's the Q equals three case of the Hermitian construction, that gives us 112 lines on the Fermat quartic, and that was recently shown by the same Rams and Schutt and the same kind of method, is the best in uh, characteristic three, and in all other characteristics, it turns out that 64 is best possible, except in characteristic two, that surface actually becomes singular in characteristic two, and you have to construct some other way, and the TR have eventually found that you can get only 60 in uh, characteristic two. So that, I think, is the last D for which these bounds are known for any characteristic. I mean, for which the exact count is known. Uh, likewise for double planes and complete intersections of like three quadrics in P5, uh, if you want, K3s of degree eight, and all of these other kinds of questions. So, uh, we now know what NQ is, NP is, excuse me, when P is one more than a prime power, because the Fermat surface is in fact optimal, the, the Hermitian surface is in fact optimal, I should say. So, there is an upper bound that looks a bit, you know, wonky as a, as a function of the degree, but if you write in terms of degree minus one and call it Q, you get exactly the nice factored form for the uh, Hermitian uh, surface. And likewise, for double lines and double planes, uh, there is a bound 
that uh, exists in any, in any characteristic. In any characteristic, yes. And likewise, in any characteristic for uh, degree at least, for even degree at least four, there are most this many lines. Again, it's sharp for, quart for a quartex, but it's also sharp if d equals q plus one for any odd prime power q, because if you substitute uh, d equals q plus one here, you recover q, q plus one. So that number there is uh, d minus one q plus one. Okay, so how is this possible? And why am I not getting anything as good in, finite, in, in zero characteristics? Because actually obtained by saying, suppose that my lines together with the hyperplane class span a rank R sub lattice of neuron severity. Then I get a bound that's given by this formula I don't expect you to remember. It's, I'll call it B of D comma R. And that's an increasing function of R. So the bigger R is, the higher the bound I get. Not too surprisingly, you know, bigger neurons are very accommodate more lines. And the rank can be larger in finite characteristic because you no longer have the H11 bound. All you can say is neurons are very at most rank B2. And characteristic three, excuse me, for degree three, uh, B2 is the same as H11 because it's a rational surface, but past that there is a non-trivial H20 that makes a difference. Um, and given this, it might be surprising that equality is ever attained because it's such a strange looking formula, but we have a good explanation for why it can actually be hoped to be sharp for some special values of R. And we have various other uh, conditions that have to be satisfied when equality attains. Most notably, uh, if equality is attained and you have any two lines of your B of D comma R lines, well, that gives you a plane that meets your surface in a degree D curve, which already contains two lines. So there's some residual degree D minus two curve, but that one completely splits up into lines also. So whenever you have two lines of your configuration that meet at a point, they are part of a plane on which the uh, polynomial defining the surface splits into linear. <coughs> And of course, this bound can't be attained in characteristic zero for the reason I just explained, uh, because we are off by twice d minus one choose three, but you have some hope in characteristic p, and as I mentioned, you do actually see that every once in a while. What does happen in characteristic zero? Well, we do get some bound. Unfortunately, that bound grows to, it's not as big as these the fourth, but it's d cubed. So I'm not improving on Klebsch. If I just use the fact that r is at most H11. Uh, well, for d small, I can improve on Klebsch, but the only value of d for which there is a difference is d equals 4. For d equals 3, it's 27, but we have known 27 for ages. Uh, 76 happens to look familiar. That was uh, Segre's attempted improvement. Segre's attempted improvement is no longer with us, but we already know the exact number, so that doesn't help much. However, there is a curiosity that b of 419 is 64. And you might think, well, gee, maybe there is some surface that has neuron severe rank only 19 that attains this bound. But of course, the, by now, the Xarev at I'll tell us no. I didn't know this when I found this bound two years ago. But it turns out, turns out actually the same, you know, the same mathematics that gives you this bound and the equality conditions eventually lets you get a contradiction, even though it's very close in some sense. There is a... There is a uh, as we see, there is a configuration that seems to arise, but uh, there is a subtle obstruction in the K3 Torelli theorem. Uh, oops. And, uh, <coughs> okay, so every 64 surface has to be singular, has to have row equals 20, and that, of course, is implied by the TR of um, And there are still a few further cases, even in characteristic zero, where I still get a sharp bound by restricting the lines to a proper, you know, to a, a neuron severity subgroup that might have rank less than H11. So most easily, if you just look at these lines, equality is satisfied. These lines generated a D-dimensional uh, rank D subgroup of, N of neuron severity, which contains H, 
and it turns out that b of d, d equals d. If you give me a surface that's written in this form, and you notice that, for example, the Fermat surface is of this form, that already gives you d squared lines. It, so lambda i are linear form. If you take lambda i equals lambda j equals zero, that gives you a that gives you a line. They're d squared of them. They do satisfy some conditions, but you have still this rank in the neuron severity lattice, and you get equality. Uh, a few examples in positive characteristic. Go back to our Fermat surface or our Hermitian surface, which you can remember you can write this way. <coughs> but then, if you just look at it in characteristic, you know, over the Q element field, still the same characteristic, but over the Q element field, you don't see all the symmetries, but you still see, but you still see the ones that don't involve multiplying by Q plus first roots of unity. And so this now looks like a symplectic form, and the symplectic form still has quite a few. Uh, isotropic planes, and those give rise to, this, to the same number of lines on the surface, all of which are defined over FQ, and so they're part of neuron severity that's fixed under whatever the Galois automorphism, the cute power automorphism does. That turns out to be a sub, a sub lattice of about half the rank, this rank, and in fact, that attains equality also. Uh, so for Q equals 2, 2 is the prime power, uh, that's some configuration of lines on the cubic, and so that, of course, lifts to characteristic 0. Uh, more interestingly, you can do this for Q equals 3. Uh, for Q equals 3, you are talking about K3 surfaces, but you still have a Torelli theorem, so we have a hope of lifting the configuration, and in fact, it does lift. I don't know if this is a new configuration. It's a configuration of 40 lines, each one of which meets 12 others, and all of which are on a quartic. And these move in a four-dimensional family, which is, parameterized, which is rationally parameterized. Unfortunately, the picture I started with is not an example of that. I hope to be able to show, I hope to be able to show a picture of that. I'm still two steps away of finishing that calculation. I have a model of the surface, but it's not as a quartic. Um, so I showed you some other things that I'll explain towards the end. But I do know that it's rationally parameterized. And we already have an example of such configuration. Start with the Burkhardt quartic, which is a quartic surface with some number of uh, nodes, hypersurface, excuse me, in P4. So it's a three-dimensional, right? You take a random linear section of it. You have four, four parameters for that. And you get a K3 surface with 40 lines in rank 16 subgroup of neurons are very, but it's, sort of, it's necessarily defined only over Q joint squared minus 3. You have to have cube roots of unity. So that's a different configuration. It has, it's very closely related to combinatorial. It has the same symmetry, the same, the same uh, ubiquitous symmetry group that also arises for the lines on the, on the cubic, but uh, it's not the same configuration. If anybody has seen this, please let me know about it, because there are still some... I mean, because you have this wonderful group actor, there is bound to be some wonderful geometry here, and I want to find out what it is, but if it's already somewhere in the literature I haven't searched, I don't want to be reinventing the wheel. So I'm please confuse. Here you write 15 lines, and then you say 14 lines. Where do I say 14 lines? You this is Q equals 2, there are 15 lines. Yeah, yeah. This and then you say you talked about the configuration of 14 lines. Where do I say 14? 40. 40. That's for 40. Q equals okay. 3. 40, okay. I miss her. Yeah, 40. So, so 40, 12 means are 40 lines, each one meets 12 others. Okay. And likewise for the other kinds of line counts, such as uh, double planes, the Hermitian case is again sharp for good reason, uh, and I haven't run yet a lot, uh, across any interesting cases, such as the ones I listed in the past two pages that have equality otherwise, but the Hermitian case is already interesting. Okay, so how do I do this? Uh, basically, by doing geometry in, I mean Euclidean geometry. <laughs> Euclidean geometry in the neuron severity lattice, where the neuron severity lattice isn't quite Euclidean, so I project away from the hyperplane section, and that gives me a negative definite form by the index theorem. Uh, and, well, a negative definite form might as well be positive definite, so I scale things to make it positive definite. And then I look at the, con so I start from some line spanning a rank R subgroup, project away 
from h by subtracting, as it turns out, 1 over the degree times h. So I'm now working in the rational neuron severity group. And the inner product of any two of these depends only on whether they're the same. They meet at a point or they don't meet. And in the projection, they look like this. If they meet, it's minus this number. It decreases by a factor of d minus of 1 minus d if you go from, um, uh, you know, if you go from uh, being the same to meeting at a point, and by another factor of 1 minus d if you go to them being skewed. And so now, by going to Euclidean model, I have a bunch of unit vectors that, uh, excuse me, a bunch of unit vectors, so inner, va inner products 1, or minus 1 of d minus 1, or this. And it turns out that there are ways that people who work about in, in spherical codes found like 50 years ago for getting upper bounds on the size of configuration uh, that has very few inner products and for which you know the inner products. And it's a sequence of bounds. The general scheme was found by the SART working on spherical codes. Uh, I mean, I think you the, so Goethe's and Seidel are part of it also, so maybe they started it first for, uh, uh, <coughs> for uh, error correcting codes, but the same is, it's part of the whole yoga of two-point homogeneous spaces. So the sphere is a two-point homogeneous space because any two points that are the same distance are equivalent to any other two points. So there's a huge symmetry group and you have a general theory of zonal spherical functions etc. But I don't have to do that to just do uh, the first and second bounds, and the, and the first two are all I need because there are only two non-trivial inner products that occur. So the first bound is simply the following. I'm not even going to assume units vectors in this statement. If I have any n vectors, the sum of their inner products, including the diagonal term, is non-negative. Just because that sum is the inner product of the sum of all the vectors with itself. And so equality happens when the vectors add up to zero. So that's the sum on the linear, uh, on some linear polynomial in the inner products. There is also a sum, or a similar bound for quadratic polynomials, um, which, so for unit vectors, you notice know, that the small n. n is the dimension. It's not I the same as capital N. That's right. This is a little n dimensional space. So for us, n equals r minus 1 because we have projected away from one-dimensional subspace of an r-dimensional space. So this is dimension n. Uh, so so next page. What's that? Next page. You, you went backwards. Oh, sorry. Right. Uh, yeah, of dimension n. Here it is. So for unit vectors, this is just n times the sum of the uh, inner product squared minus 1 has a non-negative sum. Why is that? Well, apply a covariant map from the sphere to the unit sphere in the quadratic uh, spherical harmonics, which is a fancy way of just saying, look at the matrix uh, VI tensor itself, subtract the one over n times identity to make it trace zero, and then look at the inner product of any two such vectors, you get this divided by n. And so that gives you the second, the start getter say they're bound. If you apply it likewise for the third, fourth, uh, degree uh, spherical functions, you get the higher bounds. But we will not need the higher bounds except at one point at the very end. So these are those bounds. How do we use them? Well, so first of all, to, to review, if you normalize the inner products by making all the vectors unit vectors, the sum of the inner products and the sum of nt squared minus 1 are not negative, and we know equivalent conditions for them to be 0. Okay, so now the only t values that are allowed to occur are, besides 1, are tau and tau prime. For us, tau is what happens when the lines are intersect. Tau prime is what happens when they're skew. Uh, the other questions, like double planes, give other choices of tau and tau prime. But in each case, one of them, oh, I messed up. Tau is less than 0. Tau prime is bigger than 0. But they're always in close, in close 0. So here's the way we combine them look at the sum over all these n squared inner products of t minus tau times t minus tau prime. On the one hand, that kills all of the off-diagonal terms. And so that's just the sum of, you know, the sum, number of diagonal terms, which is n times the size of each one, which is, you know, just this constant. On the other hand, this is a quadratic polynomial, 
So I can write it as a constant plus a linear plus a multiple of nt squared minus 1 by working in reverse order and first matching the quadratic term, then the linear, then the constant. In fact, quadratic term, I know, it's 1 over n. So suppose also that a1 is non-negative, a2 is non-negative, we know, and that tells us that each one, so this contribution to the double sum is non-negative, this contribution is non-negative, so it's at most, so it's at least a naught n squared. So now you play these two bounds against each other, a naught n squared is less than or equal to that, which is equal to n times this, that's an upper bound on n. Assuming also that a naught is positive. And in fact, it's, uh, uh, so if A0 is positive, it turns out that the inequalities you need are, you need this for A0 for n variety, this for A1. At any rate, if both of these are satisfied, you get this, you know, it's just a box. A0 is an integer. What's that? A0 is an integer. No. Why should A0 be an integer? It's some, some rational number in our case. Okay, but then how you get the next one? How do, it doesn't have to be an integer. It's a positive real number. It's a positive real number. Yeah. Usually a rational number for us. I mean, it's a rational function of tau tau prime and little n. Okay. Right. And the other thing. Excuse me? Okay. Right. And, I mean, you can, you can do the arithmetic and do it. I just didn't want to cover the page with, you know, more impenetrable formulas. Sure. Uh, I figured I needed to exhibit something, and so I chose to exhibit the final formula for n in terms of tau tau prime and the dimension. <laughs> so you actually need the denominator of that to be positive. And... Well, that condition is satisfied for us. Tau plus tau prime is less than or equal to zero because I made sure that d is at least three. And n can't be, so remember, tau tau prime is negative, so I don't want n to be too large, but it turns out that the Betty number upper bound is sufficiently tight that one plus tau tau prime n can't actually become negative. And when you plug everything in and do a bit of arithmetic, you get, whoops, you get the final bound that I exhibited before. Uh, for a double plane, you do the same game. Here, tau and tau prime turn out to be each other's negatives, not too surprisingly. Uh, they are plus or minus 1 over d minus 1, and you get this kind of bound. It looks roughly the same kind of thing. There is a denominator with some rational function of d and n. And again, there is some condition that says the denominator had better be positive, but it is because Betty numbers. Uh, and again, if you substitute the second Betty number itself, you get a bound that's attained by the, by the Remission surface. Um, but the Remission double plane. Okay. So that's a proof of the bounds. Why does such a rigmarole have any chance of giving us a sharp bound? Well, because there's a nice equality condition. Remember that. Uh, <coughs> Equality in, for the first bound meant that the vector is added up to one to zero. In the second bound meant that basically the sum of their tensor squares added up to a multiple of the identity. Uh, that's equivalent. Both of these conditions together are equivalent to saying that those unit vectors form a spherical two design, which is usually defined the equivalent uh, form. If you have any polynomial function of degree at most two, then its average over the sphere can be obtained by averaging over the points. So people have been interested in these for a long time for reasons ranging from, you know, nice distribution of points and spheres, uh, numerical integration rules, etc. There is quite a, uh, quite a bit of literature about them, and not just for two, of course. You can probably guess if it also works in the third bound, it's a three design, etc. And this bound is satisfied automatically if your configuration is symmetrical enough. Because if your configuration is symmetrical enough, uh, that basically G acts irreducibly, well, then by representation theory, there are no invariant linear forms, and there's no invariant quadratic forms that aren't in the norm. And a sum like this, if F is orthogonal to the norm, is automatically zero because it's invariant under the group. And so anytime you have a configuration that is symmetrical enough that the group acts irreducibly on that chunk of neuron severity, then you automatically have equality. And that satisfied for all of our, exa or our Hermitian examples because they have huge symmetry groups and it satisfied in a few other cases where our configuration has a nice large symmetry group. 
And I think that accounts for all the cases they know or equals yours. But they're still, you know, we like examples that have right symmetries, and so this is a way of, uh, you know, this, this is another nice thing about it. Um, okay, but now you have a spherical two design where there are only two inner parts that occur other than one. You can form a graph by saying, join any two points if their inner product is tau, let's say. So going back to our original configuration, this is a bit confusing because lines correspond to points. So the vertices of your graph are the lines, and two points are connected if and only if the corresponding lines meet. And the claim is that this is what's called a strongly regular graph when you have the two designs. Strongly regular, I remind you, okay, regular just means all the degrees are the same. So if you give me, for any point, if you count the number of neighbors, that does not depend on choice of points. Strongly regular means if you give me any two points and count their common neighbors, that depends only on whether it's the same point, in which case that you just recover regularity, or they are disjoint, or they are connected. So there are three possible numbers, but you know, there are some easy combinatorial relations between them. And uh, by integrating suitable quadratic polynomials, you see that our two design is automatically giving rise to a strongly regular graph. And those have been studied for a long time, also by combinatorialists for various other reasons. And again, symmetries are one nice way of getting there. So, uh, in our setting, that means if you have equality, let's say, in the bounds for, uh, for lines on a degree D surface, then if you tell me whether two of the lines meet or skew, that tells me how many other lines meet both of them. By some explicit rational functions of D and R and N, which I am not going to bother you with. Uh, but it's some explicit rational function, and in particular, it turns out that if Li and Lj meet at a point, then we plug this into the algebra and we find that there are D over two other lines that meet, that meet both of them. Now, I allow myself to say, to use just a bit more about the actual geometry of the surface. Because if you give me three lines, if you give me two points, two lines that meet, and you give me another line that meets both of them, it has to be in the same plane. With the one exception that if it meets at the point of intersection, it's going outside the plane. But you see, my surface is smooth, so that can't happen. Because if I have a smooth surface, any line on it has to be contained in a tangent plane at each point. And there's only one tangent plane. So all the lines through this point have to go, have to, go to one plane anyway. And so all of these lines are in the same plane. I don't know they might go through this point or not, but they all also meet each other. And so going back to our graph, that means that the two points I start out, the two verses I start out with, together with their common neighbors, form what's called the clique. It's a, connection, a collection of points or vertices, any two of which are adjacent. So, uh, so that's a property of our graph that must be satisfied in our equality case. And it turns out that this is something that the combinatorialists have been looking at also. Uh, I happen to know about these uh, you know, sphere packing bounds because I've done some work on, you know, the Dessart bounds because I've done work on sphere her cause and like, I knew that, you know, Jacques Tietz introduced, uh, introduced generalized quadrangles some time ago to study certain finite, uh, you know, uh, fi finite si nearly simple groups, but I didn't think I'd ever have any reason to learn about generalized quadrangles, and I don't know if anybody else here knows, has, has run across GQs before, I certainly didn't know, am I allowed to say I didn't know Jacques Tietz about them? But uh, anyhow, uh, so uh, <clears throat> if you look at just those cliques and the lines that, and, and, the, and the vertices, those themselves form a combinatorial structure. You have some vertices, you have some cliques, which ones contain which ones, and we have a generalized quadrangle, in this case, n equals 4 of a Tietz generalized n-gon. Uh, 
Uh, and again, while this was where people, you know, had to the trails of the classification of groups, there was a lot of work just on these quadrangles, and there has been some work on classifying them for certain values of D and R, and we can use that to, uh, to say more things about our uh, equality cases. So, for example, uh, I mentioned that uh, <coughs> there is a bound that seems to be to have a chance of being attained for a K3 surface with a configuration of 64 lines all in the rank 19 subgroup of uh, neuron severity. And that would correspond to a GQ with parameters for which they have already been classified by, as it turns out, Dix minus Zara. There is such a thing, and it's unique up to isomorphism. And here's what it looks like. There are 64 vertices, and they form a three-dimensional space over F4 cube. It's really an affine three-dimensional space. There is not going to be a canonical choice of origin. Two of them are adjacent, depending on whether, where the difference is. The degree of the graph will be 18, and there are going to be th six lines for which uh, V minus W is, so a line is a one dimension, is a one dimensional space, so they correspond to points in P2 of F4. So if you look at the, the course, so this is a point in P2 of F4, in that P2 over 4, you can find what's called a hyperoval or maximal oval of six points, no two of which are collinear. There is a unique such configuration up to symmetry. Remarkably enough, every, every permutation of these six points can be realized. It's the beginning of yet another lead story in combinatorics that I'm not going to bother you with here. But if you make this condition that two points are adjacent, if they differ by a point that corresponds, but by a vector that corresponds to one of these six points, then you get a generalized quadrangle, and uh, it's one with a nice group of symmetries, and you can hope that that's the configuration of lines on a K3 surface. It seems to come close. You can form the lattice and check that there are no, uh, no vectors of norm, you know, of norm small enough to make the surface singular. Unfortunately, uh, or maybe fortunately, because we don't want to refute the uh, theorems that's already in the literature, uh, it's impossible for the, for the strange reason that uh, L star mod L, the discriminant group, has too high a two rank. It has a two rank of five, which is bigger than the co-dimension. It's bigger than 22 minus uh, 19, which is three. And so it cannot embed it primitively. You might think, well, maybe I can embed it in primitive vectors to say the actual lattice also contains some half vectors. But if you put in any half vector, and there's only one choice because of the symmetry group, uh, up, to, up to equivalence, you do get vectors that indicate that there are uh, minus two curves orthogonal to H, which makes the surface similar. So in fact, that's impossible. That gives us an independent proof that any surface that attains the 64 bound has to be singular and has to have the lines or form a, uh, a, a, a rank 20 subgroup of neuron severity. Why doesn't this show that there's a singular K3 with 64 lines? Why doesn't it show that there is one? Yeah, How would... I mean, it seems that the lattice would... Doesn't matter. This lattice is, if you had, if you had that configuration, then you'd have a configuration of 64 vectors which form a rank 19 sub you, you have configuration of 64 lines which form a rank 19 sub -lattice. And that sub is not primitively embedded. The fact that there happens to be a 20th vector somewhere else doesn't change that. No, no, but I mean, then go to the primitive closure. So you add some half vectors. Uh, but you can't add the half vectors because those make the surface singular. Yeah, so fine. A singular surface. Oh, but once a singular, once a surface is sing, oh, okay, I'm sorry, you meant singular in the geometric singular, sense, not in the case. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the problem is once you have a singular surface, the singularities eat up lines, right? So in the lattice, two, point, two, uh, two, vector, two minimal vectors in L star that would give you two different lines 
give rise to the same geometric line if they're equivalent modulo the A1 that you've added from, from here. Mm -hmm. So you don't actually get a surface with 64 lines. You get some singular surface with, you, know, you get a one parameter family of singular surfaces with fewer than 64 lines. I guess I should have computed what that family is. I don't know what it is, but it would be interesting to see what the, what the count is, but it's not 64. Um, any other questions? Okay, and finally, a double plane model. Remember, here tau and tau prime are each other's negatives. So I don't actually get tau plus tau prime negative. That means I don't actually get a two design. And I don't get a two design because all of the quadratic conditions are still satisfied, but the linear ones isn't. There is no reason that the linear. Uh, that the sum of all the vectors should add up to zero. In fact, we know it won't in general because remember there are two pairs of, so there are pairs of lines and for each one of them I could have chosen two different vectors. I mean, either of two different vectors to put in my configuration. If I chose a different one, the sum of the vectors would change. So what I really should do, instead of choosing randomly one from each pair, is choose both of them. That gives me a centrally symmetric configuration of two n vectors and that actually is a three design. The three part is automatic once it's centrally symmetric because the sum of any cubic polynomial and the integral of any cubic polynomial is zero. So I get a nice three design. And again, those have been studied for, for you know, symmetric three designs besides for other reasons. And this, the three design condition is automatic if you have a large enough group active. Because again, the sum of quadratic, the integral of quadratic polynomials you get from the symmetry cubic polynomials are sort of automatic once you have center symmetry. And so that tells us that a priori, the bound we got for the Hermitian double plane had to be sharp because there's a huge symmetry group and you can check that it's actually reducible. Okay, so just a few last things. Um, how did I get into this kind of question being a number theorist? Uh, well, sphere packing, but I didn't know there was going to be sphere packing there. Um, for her quote, I should have said. What started this thing going was the theorem of Caparazzo, Harrison, Mazur, which said that if you believe enough conjectures like Lang, Bogomolov, which we'd heard about already in, I think, the first talk, uh, for every G, there's going to be an absolute bound, every G at least two, there's going to be an absolute bound on the rank, on the number of points of rational points of a genus G curve over Q, or indeed over any fixed number field. And again, we're in the situation where we can't expect to find that, and so it's an interesting, to find the actual number, and so it's an interesting question to give construction. And Joe Harris, the same Harris of Caparazzo Harris Mazur, already suggested that if you have a, you know, if you have, let's say, a double plane that's branched on a sextic, that doesn't look like much of a sexist. And you cut it with a random line. Each time you had one of these tritangent lines that on which the surface reduces, on which the sextic reduces to a square, it reduces to a square here, and that means that you get a rational point on the intersection of that line with this one. And so you get a family of genus two curves with as many pairs of rational points, at least as many pairs of rational points, as the tritangent lines we started with. And so, at least if I was able to define everything over Q, that would let me find large families of, uh, okay, excuse me, let me find families of genus two curves with large counts of rational points. And likewise, if you gave me a surface of degree, let's say, four, and I cut it by a plane, each time I had a line on that surface, it gave me a line on the resulting degree four uh, curve. And so that gave me a construction of degree three curve, uh, degree four curve, usually genus three, which have at least as many points as the number of lines I started with. And that lets me, you know, give me, gives me a starting point for trying to find the Fantin records, like infant families with lots of point pairs, etc. And both of these cases are K3, and so we still have a Torelli theorem, and we still know what to look for, though one has to then develop techniques for actually computing these surfaces so that one can 
you know, play these games explicitly and not just say, you know, okay, I have a family that I know to be defined over Q that has 40 pairs of rational points, but I can't actually give you an example, which is a bit annoying when you're claiming to be doing something with rational numbers. Uh, so I can give examples, and the, I, I did a lot of this with genus 2 curves, uh, and here the current bound, the current record is uh, there are 300, there's one curve with 321 pairs that was found by uh, Stoll somewhere between either the very end of 2008 or the start of 2009 by looking at one of, fam one of several families I got from uh, a double-plane model of the singular K3 surface with discriminant minus 163. It has to be a, uh, it has to be one of, this, one of these magic uh, numbers to, uh, to allow everything to be defined over Q, which uh, Matthias proved in one way and I have another way of proving it, but at any rate, 163 is barely large enough that you can almost avoid all singularity if your sextic actually does have to have a singular point, so you have to apply these techniques that account for how singular points eat up lines, but are still able to get 50 or so lines, and with some additional tricks, infant families with 75 pairs and isolated curves with many more. And then uh, I'm starting now to do the same thing for cortex. And so what I showed at the beginning of the talk was unfortunately not uh, not one of the wonderful 4012 uh, cortex, but it's a model of the surface as a smooth cortex, and there are literally thousands of those. This one has one of the largest line counts. The, lar the maximum is 46 among all, of, uh, among all of the 163s, among all of the modules of this surface. Uh, this shows some of the lines of a surface that has 42 and then you can cut by a plane and get at least 42 points, and you can play various tricks like, well, there are random higher degree curves you can find on the surface, so put your, curve, your, your uh, plane through some of those, etc. So, uh, I guess we are at an institute for uh, arts and creativity, and you know, I mentioned at the beginning that we have models of these going back to the 19th century, and I think it's about time for us to apply our three-dimensional printers to, uh, to make some new such models that use you know, 20th and 21st century mathematics uh, for some of our uh, display cases. Uh, but putting that aside, I'm also hoping that, as I mentioned before, if this 4012 family is actually new, there should be some neat geometry and symmetry to come from that. So. Uh, that's all I have. Oh, except one more thing. Um, you can ask, you can try to do the same thing in higher dimensions, like planes on a cubic threefold, or cubic, uh, on a, uh, or a degree D, not, not threefold, fourfold, right? Has, has to be half in middle dimensions so you can do intersection theory again. And again, there is a natural candidate for the no largest number of planes on a smooth surface of degree Q plus one, which is work in the Hermitian setting, and again you count how many maximum isotropics there are, and it's this formula that generalizes what we saw in dimension two, and you might guess that that's maximal. I can't prove this, but I can, except in one case, you know, except for beyond the case of surfaces, which is for surfaces, excuse me, for planes on a cubic fourfold, where there are 891 planes in characteristic two on the diagonal cubic, and that's actually maxima. Uh, so what's changed? <coughs> well, if you play the same game, project away from the hyperplane class, uh, now there are three non-trivial linear products, because any two planes can be the same, in which case, of course, the linear part you know, but they can meet in a line, they can meet at a point, or they can miss each other at all. So there are three possible values of the inner product, I now need a cubic del start, et cetera, bound, and then I can write the polynomial, the cubic polynomial as an combination of the ones I know together with a new one, which happens to be this. In general, it's a Gegenbauer polynomial. And again, all the coefficients have to be non-negative for me to get a bound at the end, and this fails with the one exception of uh, Q equals two for the, for the uh, case of planes. 
And, well, one can always get some explicit upper bound if one cares by using more and more of these Gegenbauer estimates, but uh, for now, I think it's nice that we actually get a sharp bound even even one case. And again, we could have predicted it was sharp because uh, these 891 uh, lines have a huge symmetry group acting on them. Uh, it's actually quite a nice configuration. Uh, they actually form a five design. Usually, it should just be a three design, but there's an extra miracle that happens for in this case. And we have extra miracles like this in dimensions near 24. They often have to do with the leech lattice. And in fact, this is a, these 891 vectors are a projection of the minimal vectors of the leech lattice to some co-dimension two part. And so, in fact, that's connected with the fact that the automorphism group, which is essentially U6 of two, is in fact the maximal subgroup of the automorphism group of leech. So, uh, that finally is all I have. So, thanks again, uh, well, for bearing with me, uh, for lots of math conversations with Joe Harris, some with Eric Reeder, and uh, lots of both math and references from uh, Matthias. A lot of computational work was done with GP and Maxima. Pictures were drawn with Sage. Uh, NSF award, and of course, uh, the invitation from Burrs to do math in this wonderful setting. So, thanks again. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Yeah. It seems to me that uh, with, uh, with your method, yeah. you can also generalize the Questions when I mm -hmm. wanted to ask you whether you have uh, tried this generalization. Instead of taking smooth surfaces, yeah. uh, you could take uh, nodal surfaces and give an upper bound for the number of nodes and lines contained uh, in the surface. Um, I can do that, but probably, but it gets complicated because, in particular, there are, if you have a node, there are lines that miss the sorry, there miss, that miss the node, and there are lines that go through it. Yeah. So actually, when you even when you resolve all the nodes, you get some you get some more complicated configuration. There are three kinds of objects. There are and, three kinds, but also you have the formula with three. Uh, that's true. But okay, you're you're not going to. It, it's a different three. There are three kinds of objects. There are many different kinds of intersections. Mm -hmm. Right? So yes, I can, I can use a formula with degree 3, and I can use higher degree formulas. It's probably not going to be sharp, and because you know, the symmetry, there's only a few nodes, and so you don't expect to have enough symmetry to, uh, to, uh, enough, enough symmetry to get sharp bounds everywhere. You'll get some number, and it might be interesting. It might, you know, I might be able to push it you know, an 80 down to a 76 or something like that. But yeah. By the way, for tritangents, to a effect that can characteristic zero, my upper bound happens to be 76 again, almost certainly not sharp. The best I know is 72, which is a nice configuration, but not quite enough symmetry. Um, okay, so I hope I answered your question. Say that again? What's the bound again for? You can, for double sex, What's the Miyoko inequality? Double sextic meaning y squared equals. Yeah, yeah, something like uh, well, uh, it's a K three surface, so I'm not sure what, uh, what 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 inequality I'm using. It's a border fold. Uh huh. It's some border fold. Okay, so you're using the non-smooth model of it, and you're saying there is a very Okay, um, and you're saying there's a Miyoka bound in number of lines? You, you will get a get bound of 76. Um, huh, okay, I'd have to ask you about it. Because I, that, 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 that's good to know, and I, didn't, and I didn't know it before, so I'd have to ask you where. What, yeah. Could you do conex from cortex? Or? Um, I can try. It's the same problem that there are too many possible intersections. So supposing you have a cortex even that has no lines on it. Well, if you take two, if you take two conics, there are, you know, they could meet in two, one, or zero points. So I have three possible intersection numbers. Instead of, I mean, two, three possible products. 
I get some upper bound by using DGS3, it's not going to be sharp. I have some, some examples of uh, cortex that have no lines and there's one that has 800 conics. I, I think I did actually compute the upper bound, which was not 800, it was, some, it was a bit over 1,000. Yeah, so one can, I've tried to find other cases where there's a prize, or of course the most interesting one is you can actually get a sharp bound and I haven't found any others. And I've already talked for, you know, almost an hour, so I didn't want to add yet more things here. <laughs> if you take your 891 uh, configuration, so you have a four fold containing 891 planes, right? And you, say, project from those, I mean, you, you get uh, quadric surface bundles over P2, yeah. standard construction, but, and then you get a double plane branched over a sextic. Yeah. Can you get some relationship on the on your question for the lines in, in that double plane, just from this configuration that's, by projecting from all the different 891 planes? That's an interesting uh, interesting question. Of course, we're in characteristic two here, so double sextics look a bit funny. Um, there is, I mean, the, the, the 21 lines on the, on the, on the 112 lines, excuse me, I think those are also involved somewhere in the, in the leech lines, but in a completely different direction. Uh, the short answer is a good question, but I don't know. <laughs> it would only go in one direction, right? I mean, 